Hey students, welcome back to Buddy. Let's review chapter 31 notes. The setting took place at Little T's house and we were introduced to a new character. His name is Eddie. That's Mrs. Washington's grandson who returned from Iraq. Okay. Little T made a plan on how he can get Buddy back from California. He made signs and handed them out at the church and he began to do odd jobs for many people. Remember, he wants to raise the money so he can get to California to get Buddy back. Brother James receives a letter from the shelter that Buddy was adopted by a family in California. Daddy tells Little T that Buddy just isn't his dog anymore. And then Daddy says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm always saying I'm sorry. So daddy feels bad um, that there really isn't much that he can do to help little T now because Buddy has been adopted by a family. He's not just at the shelter anymore. He's been adopted. Chapter 32. I don't think I can go to church the next morning. Eddie's going to be there. He's going to know I'm the kind of boy who would hit a dog like that. He's going to say, that boy don't deserve to get his dog back from California. And he's going to be right. But daddy says, I got to go. And mama says, I'm not sick. I'm just lazy. She says, if anybody ought to stay in bed, it's her. Because she can hardly raise up her arms. But one thing she's not doing is missing church. I get off easy. Eddie ain't in church. I guess he's more worn out than he let on. We're filing out afterward and three different people come up to me with work they need done. The lady who had all her bushes ripped out wants me to come plant her new ones. Mr. Nelson's decided he wants to do something about his front yard and wants me to come over and start whacking down the weeds so at least he can see what's going on in the street from his front window. An old lady I never noticed before says, can I come over and help her move her sofa? She don't like where it is and she can't lift it by herself. I'm making all my arrangements when brother James comes up to me. Got another letter yesterday, he says. It came after you left out. You'll like this one better. I grab it out of his hands and huddle off to the side of the steps while he's still shaking hands and Mama and Daddy are chatting up the neighbors. Dear Reverend James, we are the family who adopted Buddy. Katrina caused so much loss. It makes us sad to think that a family also lost such a wonderful, kind, dear dog as Buddy. Please put us in touch with the family who lost Buddy. We love Buddy very much, but we want to do the right thing. Perhaps something can be worked out. I don't even get to the sincerely part before I'm jumping up and grabbing Daddy's arm and saying, read this. Look here, Daddy, read this. He says, what happened to my manners? And I say, read this here, read it. So he takes it out of my hands and he reads it. And then he passes it over to mama. She reads it with her forehead all wrinkled up and says, well, I'll be. Then she gives it back to daddy and daddy gives it back to me. Well, little T, he says, I hope you got some of your grandpa in you. I hope you know how to write a good letter. It's all on you now. Okay, so basically the family that adopted Buddy, they reside in California, wrote to uh, Brother James stating that they're willing to um, be in contact with the family that lost Buddy, which is Little T. So Little T now has to write a letter to the family. I write the best letter that's ever been written in the whole wide world. I tell them the whole story, how I had been wanting a dog all my life. And daddy always said we didn't have the money. And then wham, we ran into buddy on the way to church. And it was meant that he would be my dog. 
I explain about why we left him and how it didn't turn out like we planned. I tell them about coming to the house and finding the note all faded and pale. I tell them how we saw Buddy on TV and I'm working to earn money and I hope, oh, how I hope, when I get enough money, I can fly out to California and bring Buddy home. I work on that letter all day Monday and put it in the mailbox just before Daddy gets home. He comes up the steps to the porch and I'm waiting for him with a copy of what I wrote. He says he don't see how anybody can say no to that letter. He washes off in the hose and pops open a beer from the cooler he keeps in the house and he sits down to rest. It won't be long before we'll walk over to the widow's house and get some supper with mama and the rest. But right now, we're just going to sit on the porch and stare at the evening. We ain't been staring five minutes when up comes Mr. Nelson. He's walking fast like he's in a hurry or like he's mad. I'm thinking, was I supposed to go there today? Was it today? He sits down beside Daddy on the step. You want a beer? Daddy says. He shakes his head. I don't have time. Was I supposed to come today? I say. He looks up at me like he's just noticed me. No, no, whenever. He waves his hand at me like I ain't hardly there. Daddy's looking hard at him. What's troubling you? He takes a deep breath. I got some bad news. Daddy waits a second, but Mr. Nelson don't say anything. Well, tell it, Daddy says. Mr. Nelson gives me a sideways glance. It's about your friend, he says. That J-boy. Daddy raises up his eyebrows. And about Eddie, Mr. Nelson says. Daddy sits down his can. Eddie wasn't at church yesterday, I say. No, Mr. Nelson says. He's in jail. Jail? What for? Daddy says. He shot J-Boy. We can't think of one single word to say. Mr. Nelson sitting there nodding his head. Then he twists to look at me again. But don't worry, he says real quick. J-Boy ain't dead. But how, I start. Mr. Nelson holds up his hand. I'll tell it. I just got to think how to start. We wait. It's like this. Turns out J-Boy's living here by himself. His mama's still in Houston. I knew that, I say. He ain't got nowhere to live. He's hanging out with a bunch of thugs. They're camping out in empty houses. Daddy looks over at me and I look back at him. They're stealing to feed themselves and to buy their drugs, Daddy says. That too, Mr. Nelson says. So what's all that got to do with Eddie, Daddy says. Well, everybody knows Eddie's got guns in that place he's staying. Everybody knows he's over here Saturday helping you hang rock. That's the sheet rock. He gets home Saturday evening and his place has been broken into. It's been tossed up and down. But Eddie ain't no fool. He's got his guns hid in a place he made in the floor. He hears a noise. He gets his gun. He creeps through the rooms. And there's J-Boy pulling Eddie's clothes out of his drawers and stuffing Eddie's jewelry in his pocket. So Eddie says, stop. And J-Boy reaches for something under his shirt. Eddie shoots. J-Boy falls. Eddie calls the police. They take J-Boy to the hospital and Eddie to the jail. But that ain't fair, I say. What's Eddie going to do? Mr. Nelson heaves a sigh. <sighs> Ain't nothing he can do, Mr. Nelson says. Ain't nothing at all. Okay, so J-Boy breaks into Eddie's house, you know, where Mrs. Washington's house and is stealing. And Eddie hears a noise, and once J-Boy reaches for something under his shirt, most likely a gun, 
Eddie shoots Jay Boy. Now, Jay Boy is still alive, but Eddie now is now in jail. Okay. Wednesday night, we all go to the prayer meeting. We don't usually go to that, but Brother James is going to pray on Eddie, and we want to be there. So Eddie's not there, but they're going to pray for Eddie. The church is full. Brother James starts out talking about sorrow, and he moves on to strength. When he starts up the praying part, he asks God to forgive Eddie. I ain't sure what Eddie's done that he needs forgiving for. But then Brother James says, everybody needs forgiveness. And he asks God to forgive J-Boy too. Then he gets to the, what are we going to do about it part? Mr. Nelson said, there ain't nothing we can do about it. But Brother James thinks different. He wants us to pray. He wants us to keep Eddie in our prayers every day. He wants us to remember Mrs. Washington and how she was so kind to everybody who crossed her path and how she raised up Eddie when there wasn't anybody else to do the job and how Eddie turned out so good and he went off to Iraq and served his country and how now it's our turn to serve him with our prayers. But then Brother James changes it up a little. But we could do more, Lord, he prays. Lord, you know that old saying, God gives every bird its food, but he don't throw it in his nest. What does that mean? It means you give us the tools. Lord, we got to pick them up and use them. And what is the tool we've got that's going to help Brother Eddie? Right now, the one thing we've got that we can use is money. Lord, I hate to even mention that word in a prayer. Seems like we get all twisted up sometimes about money. But we've got to remember that money ain't nothing but a tool. It's what we use to get what we need. And right now, what Eddie needs is to get out of that jail so he can go on with his work until that trial comes up and that jury finds him innocent of all charges because we know that's what's going to happen, Lord, in the end. And it ain't right for Eddie to be sitting in that jail until that time comes. So, Lord, we've got to find a way to bail Eddie out of jail. And the only tool we've got to do that with is money. So we're praying today, Lord, for you to show us the way to find the money to set our brother free. Amen. Lots of times when Brother James prays like that, People are shouting out during the prayer or hollering, Hallelujah, when it's done. But this Wednesday night, the whole church is sitting there quiet and still. Ain't nobody standing up and saying, I've got a dollar I can give. I ain't surprised. Brother James is talking about a lot of money. Ain't nobody sitting there got much to spare. They've got houses to build and babies to feed. Maybe there's somebody else sitting in jail we don't know about. Maybe they've got sorrows they ain't shared. Brother James is standing there at the front of the church with his hands held up in the air. He's looking out over the congregation. He's waiting for somebody to stand up and give his might. Give something, right? He's waiting and he's waiting. But nobody stands up. I poke daddy. Ain't you got a dollar? I whisper. If everybody in this room gives one dollar, he whispers, we won't even make a dent. Brother James's arms are drifting down. That room is hot as Hades. I'm sweating and shifting in my seat. All of a sudden, I stand up. I can't believe it. My mouth pops open and I hear myself talking. I've got some money to give. I say, I've got $215. I'll give that. I sit down fast so I don't faint. My heart is beating so loud I can't hear any other sound. Daddy's looking at me like I've lost my mind. Mama reaches out her hand and puts it on my knee. Tanya's grinning with her mouth full of white teeth. I hear other people starting to stand up. I hear people singing out numbers. I bend my head down. 
Oh, buddy, I'm thinking, what have I done? What have I just done? Okay, so what did little T do? Right, what did he do? He stood up and he said that he has some money that he can give to help bail Eddie out of jail. Where did little T get that money, the $215? Well, you guessed it. That's all the money he's earned so far from doing all those odd jobs so that he could get to California to get Buddy back. And here he just stood up in church and he gave it away to help out Eddie. So little T is a generous, kind, caring, and compassionate person. Chapter 32 notes. Okay, so the setting takes place in the church. Brother James receives a letter from the family that adopted Buddy. Little T writes a letter to the family. Mr. Nelson tells the news that J-Boy has been shot by Eddie and is in the hospital. Eddie is in jail. Little T's family attends the Wednesday night prayer meeting at the church where everyone is praying for Eddie. No one has money to bail Eddie out of jail. Little T stands up in orphans to give away all the money he earned to get Buddy back from California. And Little T wonders what he has just done. So he sends a message to Buddy. Oh, Buddy, what have I done? What have I just done? Here's the stop and jaw question I want you to take very seriously and think about. Would you have been able to give up the money you saved to rescue your dog in order to help someone else? And I want you to explain why or why not. Would you have been able to do that? The money that you earned and saved to rescue your dog in order to help someone else. Okay, so I will see you. Uh, when we do chapters uh, 33 and 34, those will be combined chapters. Okay, and I will see you at Zoom. Bye.